Hi, I'm Zach Kirkup, the business editor of the National Indigenous Times. Thanks so much for joining us on the first episode of Indigenous Insights. I'm joined here today by Amanda Healy. Amanda, thank you so much for coming on NIT's first ever uh, podcast episode. It's so good to have you with us. Thank you. What an incredible honour to be first cab off the rank. First and best, I think. Yeah. First and best. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but we'll see. Um, I think we're, I'm going through your bio. It's, a, it's an amazing um, level of achievements that you've, you've had over your time in business and in the community. I, I get a sense that it's sort of been a continual sense of growth and, and evolution in this direction. Do you want to talk about a little bit how you started off in business or where, where, you, where you come from um, sure. and, and how you got into it? I wouldn't say it's continuous. It sort of might look like that yeah. retrospectively, but yeah. actually working through it, it's never like that. You know, it's sort of three steps forward and five steps back type of... Um, I think everyone's like that. Or maybe I'm more like that than most. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so my people are the Wanarua people from the Hunter Valley in New South Wales. I... Uh, came to Western Australia from about 13 years old. My father was Aboriginal, my mum wasn't. Uh, and he was very dedicated to his people and loved working, particularly with bush blackfellas. Yep. Um, he eventually became a surveyor and did a lot of the roads around oh. remote Western Australia. So when you're driving, particularly, I, I always think of the road to Kalbarri, which I remember very clearly him doing. So that was a dirt track when we first moved to Jerusalem. That's Geraldton. amazing. Yeah, so that area. Uh, he did quite a lot up in the Kimberley. He did uh, all of around the gold fields and those very remote, you know, Leinster around those areas. And he loved being there and he loved working with the local mob. So that's sort of my family, my recollections of my dad. Mm. Uh, he struggled, obviously, with his identity. At that point in time, it was very difficult to be an Aboriginal yeah. man and try and make a living and be, you know, like, committed to your people and culture. And, um, so there was this constant tension in his life. So I sort of... I grew up around that sense of difficulty for our people um he, yeah so that was my early life I guess we lived in Geraldton I went to, did a bit of schooling there spent a lot of time wagging school you know <laughs> as you do um I also prior to that we'd lived in Rockhampton in central Queensland and came from Rockhampton over here where I did my secondary started secondary schooling and finished it in Geraldton we moved over here really for a better life uh, but also for dad to escape the scrutiny of yeah. being an aboriginal man in an environment where it wasn't a great thing not many people knew him over here whereas in New South Wales and Queensland, his family was well known. Um, and, yeah, so, you know, so that's, that's sort of my family background, yeah. if you like. How do we get from Geraldton to into, or I guess into business? How did, you, how did you first become interested in it? Yeah, so I guess from a young age, I was always very interested, my dad being a surveyor, I was always very interested in big things and, you know, um, I guess big commercial projects type stuff. He did a bit of work for Allied Eniaba, mm -hmm. so in, in mining, if you remember, if anyone yeah, remembers yeah, Allied yeah, Eniaba, yeah, yeah. that's ancient history really. <laughs> uh, he worked around in mining, so I was always interested in that, always had an interest in that. Um, and so one of my, uh, I guess I started work at, I think I was 15 when I started work and I worked in, you know, the corner shop. Um, stuffing chickens for, you know, for roasting to sell <laughs> and um, all sorts of stuff. You do, you yeah, know, yeah. I spent um, a couple of seasons working for Mick Kalis up in Exmouth. Oh, yeah. um, then I started doing remote communities work, which I always loved. I'd do, you know, went up to Groot Island and worked there in, uh, in for a fishing company up there and worked in the office and worked in the factory and did all that sort of stuff for a few years and sort of, I guess, you know, like now looking back, I, I let my brain develop a bit, yeah, you know, because yeah. at that age you're not really responsible. Every cent I got I spent on, you know, alcohol or partying or buying new clothes or whatever and it wasn't a lot of money in those days, I must say. Um, 
But uh, then I was married at 19 in Geraldton and divorced about two years later. So it was yeah. a very rapid turnaround there. Um, and uh, started work for BHP uh, probably in my early 20s. And that was sort of my dream job. And I loved it. What loved were you work. doing there? I was working in the recruiting yeah, right. and HR team. So I eventually moved and worked at a whole lot of places for BHP. I totally loved it, loved that environment, loved the craziness of mining and the rawness of mining yeah. in those days. It was a little bit crazy. You know, the guys used to wear singlets and stubbies to work. <laughs> good look, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I worked in places like Coolan Island and Groot Island and Port Hedland and... Uh, down in the southwest at Bean Up on the Bean Up project. Oh, yeah, right. So I did the Bean Up project, and then from there I went to Canada to work in the Northwest Territories. Still with BHP? With BHP, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and the Northwest Territories was like the polar, well, literally, literally, yeah, yeah. <laughs> literally speaking, <laughs> the polar opposite of uh, the, the, the Pilbara. So I think I, I tell the story that the day I left Perth to go to. Uh, Canada. Was, was that your first travel, by the way? It was very early travel. Yeah, I think right. I'd been to Singapore okay. before. <laughs> so, it was, <laughs> you know, I, was I thought I was pretty Very cool. international. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I, uh, the day I jumped on the plane from here to go to Canada was in February and we'd had one of those beautiful long stretches oh, yeah. of 40 degrees where, you know, where you, the heat, you can't breathe and, yeah. it, and, you know, you walk outside and you feel like you're hairs searing off. So 40 degrees, I flew into... Ca the, day I, the day before I left, I went and bought the heaviest suit I could find in DJs in town, <laughs> thinking, oh, I'm going to die in this, you know, like it's so going to be so hot and I'll be perfectly warm. I got there and it was 40 below oh, the day yeah. I flew into a town <laughs> called Yellowknife. Yeah. Very different experience. <laughs> and DJ's warmest suit was pathetically inadequate. <laughs> but it was a great lesson to, you know, like, because I had a picture in my head of what 40 below would be like and it was absolutely nothing like yeah, what yeah. it was, you know. So you forget it sears right through to your bones. It's a bit like our heat, really. Yeah, just yeah, the, yeah. Just in the opposite, <laughs> the opposite really. So uh, the, when I was up there, I met a fella and we, uh, well, I fell pregnant, so... Um, and uh, came home to have my son on my own. And that was the time that I... How old were you around that? I was 35. Yeah, right. And um, so I, so I uh, was pregnant, came home to Australia because I wasn't going to be a long-term relationship. Sure, sure. He was actually Native American descent as, <laughs> as well, so my son's got quite a... You know, he's a real mixed breed. Um, <laughs> But, and I refer to him as my Canadian souvenir. But his, <laughs> uh, his dad passed away a few years back from, um, from cancer. But uh, So I came back to Australia, had this little child on my own. My own father was dying of cancer at this time. My, and my mum was struggling to cope with that. My sister had three young children. Uh, the, I come from a family of seven, by the way. Yeah, right. But we, we all lived here and pretty close together. A lot of... The rest of my family have migrated back to the eastern states and are over there. But um, yeah, so I was young, ha had a, sorry, had a young child on my own, thinking how was I going to yeah. cope with this. So in a moment of madness, I thought oh, I'm going to start my own business because you know, like that'll give me freedom to do yeah, yeah. <laughs> what I want when I want. And in a way, it was really successful for that reason because during my son's early years at school, you know, I always used to go to the sport, um, sports like, carnivals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could be more involved with his life. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, so that was nice. He, uh, he probably now would tell you that wasn't a great thing, <laughs> that I was embarrassing. But I think that's our job as parents, isn't it, is to embarrass our kids. I, I always enjoyed it uh, whenever, the, whenever my parents were there, <laughs> uh, the very rare times. But at least you, that gives you a great opportunity, that, yeah. that balance. Yeah. Did you find that hard to find that, that, you know, obviously focusing on building a business and also how to look after your, well, young son? Yeah. Um, the first couple of years was a bit tough because I had no idea, yeah. one, about the financial stress that's placed on you as an early business owner, mm. um, two, 
how, how much time it actually takes and how you have to respond to clients' need. He was, I uh, thinking, saying, I can book meetings when I want yeah, rather yeah. than what... But it doesn't always work like that. And particularly the more you work with... Um, you know, the more you work with the larger companies, it's you have to fit yeah, around yeah. their schedules rather than ours. What was the company that you'd started and what did it do? So the, the company we started was... Well, that I started was called Max Engineering. Yep. Um, my son happens to be called Max as well. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so it was Max Engineering. What what did so this is we're sort of to, talking early two thousands. There's a lot of construction going on in the south west. Yeah. Um, Worsley Worsley was doing a. That was really the start of that boom. That again yeah, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. There were Worsley were doing a, a major upgrade and renewal. Um, Ravensthorpe was being developed and then there was a hell of a lot going on in the Pilbara. So one of the things that ha was happening at that time was, and I'd had a lot of experience around industrial relations by this time, and one of the things that was re that was happening is there was, and that still happens I think on construction projects, is they get to the last 20% of yep. the, the project, they start to lose people, people are worried about, you know, um, their own stability. Um, an income for a period, so yeah, yeah. there was these, you know, these this they would be losing people at the last twenty in the last twenty in that mo in, in that last part of uncertainty about the project and how yeah. it's going to well and, and it's finishing soon yeah soon and I need a job to keep paying for my bills so um, so we set up a little team then we we skilled them up they're mostly Kiwi boys yeah, right. um, who we we skilled up and got them ready to sort of go in and hit that last. And we called ourselves an escalator, you know, like escalation yeah, yeah, project. Yeah. So we'd finalise that last 20% of the job and bring people in time on budget, you know, That's a great idea. Approach. We highly skilled them. We, we stayed small and nimble to keep under the radar yeah. a bit as well. How many people are we talking in the company? So at in, at, it, we started off with about eight people. Um, and then it rapidly grew to like 30 to yeah, 50. Right. And we stayed pretty stable at that level yeah. um, because it was easy to know who you had. It was yeah, yeah. easy to understand, you know, but you start to grow beyond that. And it was as a single person running the business, it was hard yeah, for sure. to do that. Yeah, so that was, you know, that was where, um, where we set up. The very first job we got was at, Worsley down at Worsley Illumina and we sent sent this group of boys down there and we'd bought the little you know mo mobile welders and all oh, that yeah. the business and their toolbox toolkits and sent them down and then they got there and they didn't have blankets and pillows and so <laughs> you know like I'm out going oh why didn't I think of that yeah, you yeah. know because we hi I think it was the caravan park they stayed in down there and they you know they get a bed with a with oh, a mattress yeah, yeah, yeah. on them yeah. so there was all the nice things that they didn't have so and of course even though it was, I think it was very early January we started, even maybe late December. Um, it was in Collie and it still gets oh, it's cold. still cold, yeah. Mm. So anyway, so that was that was um, a real buzz yeah. for me to get that first group of people on the ground there. Um, that's, a, that's a great achievement, starting the business and then growing to the point where you've got, you know, 30, 40, 50 people, got good jobs going, good clients, obviously, a very stable... In, in the industry, yeah. an important part of it. You, you reached the point, was it 2015, where you moved to sell? Yes. I had... There had been a couple of approaches earlier about... Um, you know, we had a few businesses looking at us over the time. So really from about 2010, yep. um, other bigger businesses... It was just that time. You know, everybody was taking everyone over and buying their footprints and, yeah, you know, yeah. buying their contracts and all that sort of stuff. Even though, you know, the size of our business didn't... We didn't really have contracts per se. We mostly worked on p purchase orders, but yeah. it was hard to get people. It was hard to get yeah, skilled yeah. people. So and That labour market at the time as well, trying to find anyone... You know, it's a bit like what it is now, yeah. I think, in, in Western Australia particularly, and, and across the country in the employment market, where it's obviously very hard to find find people find good companies who've been around for a while and got those relationships in place. What made you want to sell in 15 after you'd been approached over those over yeah. those times? Well, it sort of got to the point... So I had a business partner um, who's 
who worked from about 2005 to 2010. And when he left, it, beca it became quite difficult yep. for me to find the right person to come in. Again, you know, right people, right time yeah, yeah. sort of stuff. Um, so I, I was finding it quite stressful, I guess, would be the yeah. way I would describe it. Um, and it, you know, like it was just, it felt right. Um, I thought it yeah, felt right. right. It wasn't until we actually sold, you know, like had an agreement. <laughs> yeah. And then it was like, and they would start, you know, they cut off my email and cut yeah, off my right. phone number. And was it an immediate sale? That was... It w no, there was a, there was, actually there was a handover of about 12 months. Okay. Um, and it was to a very large international firm. Um, and they, e even in having said that, they'd looked at the business for two years. Yeah, they yeah. sort of did a lot of um, due diligence on the business. So the, that, the company that bought us out at that time was called Thyssen Krupp, yeah. which are pretty well known. Yeah, yeah, German absolutely. German international industrialist type business. So it was pretty cool to be looked at like that yeah, business, yeah. Uh, by that business. Um, but also a bit interesting that they you know, they felt like they had to take so long to look at such a little I've, I've learned that with um, the selling, well, in, in, in buying businesses myself and then selling, going through the process of selling part of my business now, is that the time is, it takes us so much longer than you ever anticipate. Yeah. It takes so much longer to, uh, to, to sell, it takes so much longer to buy, and yeah. the, the time frame that both parties have, seller and buyer, should always be far more extended, I think. Two years for DD is a, is a long time, but then... You go, even though I've, I've found, and I'm, I'm curious as to how it went with you, even the process of getting the sale actually ready to go, yeah. it's, it's extensive, I think. It's a lot yeah. more than people think. Yeah, you have to review absolute. You know, you have to go through your books item by item. You have to, map, you know, like all of the stuff that we, you know, we knew and it was on the, you know, it was on our radar to have more formalised records, but... You know, every bit yeah, of equipment, yeah. every tool. You know, we, we had thousands of tools and they wanted to know exactly how many and what state they were in. And, <laughs> you know, like, so all of the um, uh, inventories were extensive. Yeah, right. As well as, the, as you say, the preparation, the communication piece was... And then, you know, like as I said, that letting go. Yeah. So I actually moved from Headland back to Perth at that time and... Um, started working from home, which was like it was that was a bit of a oh yeah yeah you know like it, it tore at my heartstrings a bit. It was sort of like but that's my baby you yeah. Know? Like, um, and then yeah, as I said, then once they started to do things like turn off my my email address and you know phone numbers and blah blah blah, it was sort of like hold on, yeah. <laughs> that's not, doesn't feel right. <laughs> yeah. But it was just really the The, the, the next process. progressive, right? The, yeah. So you, we've gone through that process, sold uh, sold the company. What did you sort of swing to next? And did you, while you are in the process of selling, did you know where you wanted to be after that? Was that really, a, you know, a, a plan that you had well laid out or was it sort of just see where we sit and how we go? Because <laughs> going through it from this perspective, from my perspective, is obviously... I think it, it does look well planned. It does look like it's a sort of a linear progression, but as you say, it's obviously not. Yeah, no. Um, so at when I, so when I first re when it became a thing to register as an Aboriginal business about two thousand and ten, I did all that work, and ha was doing some talks at um, like a number of industry events and mm. stuff about why you know about Aboriginal people in business and why you would engage with them and. Why you know what's the value in having average? What's the value add and why? Blah blah blah. Um, and I started going and looking for some nice Aboriginal themed things up in the Hay yeah. Street Mall, and started looking and re soon realised that there was none in DJs or yeah, Meyer yeah. or wherever. Um, and started having to look in the souvenir shops and. Yeah. Do you want to take a guess what I found at that time? Oh, I, I, I can imagine it was uh, be very very little. Um, and if, if, if anything, it'll probably, I can imagine if it's in the souvenir shop, it'll be very basic and sort of a bit like a cultural trope almost of what people think it looks like. Yeah, it was. And, you know, none of it was 
had a genuine, oh, yeah. genuine connection with Aboriginal culture at all or Aboriginal people and there was certainly no benefit to Aboriginal people. So I complained about that for a few years. So it was always in the back of my head. So yeah, right. when this sale started, I thought, OK, I'm going to have more time. What am I going to do? I'm going to do something about this. I love that. It drove me crazy. So Kirikan was born in 2014, so 10 years old this year. So I was going to, like my intent was to build that business up. It, retail and fashion and accessories is not an easy sell at the moment. And particularly at that time, you know, we were starting to see the Kmarts of the world bringing in two dollars yeah. t-shirts from china in their millions and people were throwing you know like it's been the last 10 15 years that this fast fashion thing yeah, yeah. has been a real issue globally and making a huge impact on the environment so um so it's hard to compete with that at a time when people are struggling and very different sectors too from where you were and you know the resources <laughs> sector through to fashion and, and a retail facing mm brand yeah did you find that adjustment very difficult not at all yeah no. right <laughs> no it's like like the curve sort of went like this yeah, you know, yeah like yeah, straight yeah. up and down um it 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 was different in a way but i came to realize that the process was exactly the same so project management you know you you whether whatever the fabric is there's you know you design it yeah, you yeah. you cut it you sew it or weld it together and you you know, get it out there, get it to your client whichever yeah, right. way you can. So that's interesting. Um, I have to say my least favourite thing about all of that has been learning about social media and how yep. to use it to your advantage because it's so... It's probably the most complex process on the planet. How how do you hit the right people? Yeah, how yeah. do you get them to know about you? And uh, so, so, I st so back to your question, when I... When I... Uh, knew that I was selling Max Engineering, I started looking at things and then I was, you know, for a brief moment it went through my head, I'm going to retire. Yeah, right. Um, but very quickly I sort of went, mm, I'm not going to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when I had Kirikan building, I did take some time and did an MBA just yep. because, you know, I felt like I needed to do something with my brain yep. and just to prove my, to myself that I could do that it. That makes sense. You know, yeah. yeah. So here I am, and I, was <laughs> I, I did it at Curtin, which I loved, and they were fantastic. But I have to say, the number of people who I worked with over that time, you know, including lecturers and other students, saying, what are you doing, doing an MBA, sort of with the, you know, like, and they held off saying, at your age. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they're trying to go, like, at your stage of life or, oh, you know, yeah, trying yeah. to find ways of saying. So there was a lot of curiosity about what I was doing and why I was doing it. Um, and, I, you know, like, I, you, you just still got to do stuff, don't you? You can't well, just right. lay down and die because you're, you know, in your 50s, really. So, um, so that was sort of 10 years ago and now... Um, here am I. So, so I was doing my MBA and met a couple of really great people on it, um, and we started talking about, you know, so what did you do and how did yeah, you do yeah. it and blah blah blah. And next minute, we're all in business together and you know starting all over again, which has become Warracle, of course, yeah. and uh, which has been an inc like an incredible success, way more than I would ever have imagined. And why is that? Do you, well, can you explain for those listening what Oracle does and, and then a little bit about why you think it's been so so much more successful? Was it the current environment? Do you think there's a the, the nature of... Um, well, yeah, we'll start with what Oracle does and, yeah. and, and why it's been so successful. Yeah. So Oracle um, started as principally as a shutdown business. Yeah. One of the partners had a substantial background in shutdowns in iron ore. So shutdowns for those who don't know. So a project's come into the end of its end of its useful life. So and uh, effectively. So what happens in so all of the fixed plant equipment that a mining company might have that processes the iron. So th so maybe they'll put the iron ore in one end. They wash it. They size it. They grade yep. it. Whatever. It comes out the other end and it's put on on um, on a train and sent to Port Hedland for export. So that process of 
you know, like the trucks dump the the um, the um, iron ore into, you know, like a dumper, yeah, which yeah. then crushes and screens and grades. And so there's a whole lot of rotating and moving equipment that um, if even one tiny little ball bearing comes out of place, it may it may cost a million bucks or 60 million bucks a day you yeah, know, yeah. somewhere. Anything between, you know, zero and billions <laughs> a day yeah, yeah. if so per, per certain bits of equipment aren't rotating. So what the mining companies do is organise regular um, maintenance of those things. So they plan shutdowns yeah. when there's breaks between shipping or mining or whatever their, whatever their process is. So they shut it down for it might be a couple of days and we go in and just renew everything to make sure it continues to operate yeah. in, a, in a sort of efficient manner um, and to allow the business to meet its needs. So... Shutdowns are a pretty regular thing. We send teams of up to, I think the largest team we've sent is about 280 people up to site for a wow. you know, five That's to huge. ten day shutdown. Yeah, it's great. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, so, so initially, because we knew that so well, we were uh, quite successful at that. Um, and it's sort of my background. That's what we've yeah, been doing course. in Max Engineering is that sort of work. It's sort of short-term maintenance or shutdown, shutdowns or whatever, um, support maintenance. Um, so we we started, we hit the ground in early 2017 as Warracle, um, and I think there was five employees at that wow. time. At the moment, we're up around 1,000, 1,200. So that's in five, six so it's, it's, this is it will be seven years this year we've been operating. Um, why was it successful? Why has it been successful? Mm. It's probably a whole heap of things that contribute to that. Um, and I I love to say to tell my business partners because I'd been in the you know like everyone knew who I was that's, right? That's right you know that's like right. I'm famous <laughs> right you know I keep getting hacked on uh, on Facebook so I must sure. be famous right so. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so we we uh, started in 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 2017 and mm. and um, moving along. But at that point, there was a real some of the mining companies were really starting to focus on their indigenous yeah. engagement. So I'm a 51 percent owner of the Warracle business. Um, we so one they knew who I was already. I'd been around rattling around yeah, the yeah. scene for some years. My business partners were very competent in what they were doing and particularly as soon as the shutdowns um, started to be really successful for FMG, we started to build and build and build. Yeah, right. Um, and it's just continued. In the last couple of years, we're starting to pick up project work. So not only do we do the shutdown yeah. stuff, we can take it out and build stuff. So I, I think our first right. major job was... Um, for BHP at South Flank, we yep. did um, a, a, a reverse osmosis plant for them there, which is a water plant. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I think that was nearly a year-long project. We had about 40 or 50 people on that. So we'd proven ourselves by this time to BHP. So we've got FMG, BHP. We do bits and pieces for Rio Tinto. So, you know, like it's it's – we're now playing – in a field where people like Monadelphus and, you know... Yeah, that's right. ..maybe Sivmec might be going, who the hell are these yeah, guys? Yeah. So we're rattling it up a little bit, which is good. And we're showing the mining companies that Indigenous businesses aren't just... You know, like, they're not all small... Yeah. ..and not all, you know, civil businesses. There's other things there. We're incredibly capable as a group of people. Um, very diverse backgrounds, lots of different things to offer businesses and so from that point of view that's what makes me you know that's what gives gets me out of bed in the morning is the fact that we're changing the view yeah. of who we are we're opening doors that had previously not been opened nobody ever considered there would ever be a first tier indigenous business in the mining space that it's it's interesting to see that sort of your companies the companies you've been involved in and the progression over time really as attitudes have also changed. And it's yeah. it's almost the story of, of your life, right? You know, you, you came over to Western Australia or your dad came over to Western Australia because there was a sense of uncertainty and not, not really 
embracing or was a bit worried about embracing Indigenous heritage. And then over time, similarly with your journey, I suppose, it's becoming, obviously, society's adjusting and moving in the right direction and more embracing of, of, of mob and, and then the, their place in society and in business. And your businesses have sort of grown with that mark as well. And it's a, I look at those that progression now and it, do you find it unusual or do you find have you found it difficult i suppose that you, you guys are doing an amazing job there but generationally speaking there's very few leaders like that right it was it, it was illegal for my grandfather to own a business because he was a black fella yeah. you know for, for the vast majority of his life there's no in, there's no intergenerational businesses at the very least for aboriginal people in western australia have you found that a challenge and sort of navigating now to where you are with kirikan as well do you think there's a, you know, do you see younger entrepreneurs coming through who are Indigenous and what is that, how can you, what do you think is your role, I suppose, now as someone who's been very successful going through that progression as well to help those, the young young ones come through? Yeah. And, and likewise, my father was, it was illegal for yeah. him to, you know, it was actually illegal for him to be married to my mum. Yeah. Without the permission of the, you know, yeah, the same, same, that was the same as yeah. mine. It was a... Impossible, right? Yeah. You needed the chief magistrate. I think you needed the magistrate, who was also in Geraldton. Yeah. The magistrate in Geraldton for my grandfather to marry. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Different times, isn't it? And, and so in lots of ways, I feel like I'm very fortunate. I've had incredible good luck and fair winds, if you like, sure. to, to, to see, you know, to see me through. Um... And yeah, you know, like I was what you'd probably call and these days would refer to as an early adapter. You'd yeah, I see think an that's opportunity right. and yeah. go bang. I'm a big risk taker too. You know, if I see something that I think is, you know, is a gap, I like I'll have a crack at that. Yeah. Why not? You know, like why in all sorts of fields. Um I, you know, I, I, I feel now though a very deep responsibility. I love seeing the kids through, yeah. coming through. Love seeing their their respect and depth of knowledge of culture now, which was denied to you know like a lot of us because of just the the situation. So I always feel incompetent in that area. Yeah, right. But the kids are coming through. They're you know like they're fully developed in all of those areas. They understand country. They understand yeah. community. They they have, um, and they have a real, a real commitment to making a difference, and it's a it's a, wonder you know like for me it's a really wonderful thing to yeah, see. Yeah. Given, I've you know my early years were how dishonourable it was to yeah. be Aboriginal. You know like it it's it's uh, you know, it's just that the change is dramatic, but it's coming from within the community. Yeah. There is social change across Australia, but as we saw last year, it's not as positive as you would have hoped. Mm. Um, so it's coming from us. It's coming from our community and people are ready to step forward. So I find, I feel a real responsibility to help the mob, whichever way they, yeah. w whichever way, if somebody, if one of the younger ones comes to me and says, oh, you know, can you help me? I need to start my business up. I'll introduce them to people. Yeah, that great. May, you know, we'll support them. The Warwickal business, we we help. A, we've helped a lot of Aboriginal businesses get their, you know, get on the get get their business happening. Yeah. We prioritise working with Aboriginal businesses. I think the other day I was looking. We have something like 160 Aboriginal businesses on our books. That's great. You know, ready to to go. So, you know, that's a real sense of pride for me yeah um i yeah so i'm loving seeing that um and i'm and you know like with kirikan we recently started a foundation yeah to actually actively do that in the creative industries we've not had as much support as we would have liked you know we were, we've been sort of looking for donations and support to to get that up and running but you know we'll still chip away at that. I think it takes a little bit of time to people for businesses, big business, to understand what we're trying yeah, to yeah, do. Yeah. Um, we've taken uh, people all over the world to promote who they are and what they do and to tell our stories and to display our culture, but also to send a message to the world that we're here yeah. and we're still doing it. 
and the you know the really super positive side of that that I didn't think of in doing this. I was just thinking about what we what we were presenting yeah, to yeah, the world. Yeah. But to see what it does for the Aboriginal businesses that come along, yeah, on these tour on these you know visits overseas, we might be presenting runways or whatever overseas. The change in their view of the world, they, it opens their mind. Yeah. They all of a sudden think people are not only not only interested in us but actually are respecting what we're saying and doing and it's such a you know like yeah a, yeah a like a light bulb moment. light bulb moment yeah. yeah um which is awesome it's probably the most rewarding thing that i'll do in my life is see these people see these kids come from nowhere in may 2022 we took the first lot over to yeah. brussels who'd invited Kirikan over to come and do a runway show and I sort of convinced the ambassador there that it'd be a lot better if it was because I don't represent Aboriginal Australia nor do I represent Aboriginal fashion or not as Kirikan sorry sure sure yeah not me Uh, so we ended up taking I think four brands over there and we did a runway show and we we took a a young uh, one of the young Collard boys Jack Collard with us yeah and he danced down the runway and it was just <laughs> amazing. It was just, people were like this group in Brussels who are, you know, United Nations, NATO, um, you know, all the big international organisations are located yeah, right. there. And they were all invited along, many of them Australian. And they were there in tears yeah. watching this. And they were, like afterwards, they, like that was absolutely beautiful. Two of the girls who came with us as models were, you know, remote. One was from the Tiwi Islands. Now she's gone on, she's a big star in <laughs> Melbourne and like, um, and then the other girl was from Darwin and they're just like gorgeous girls but just couldn't believe this opportunity that yeah, yeah. they, so it's it's incredibly rewarding and incredibly fun too. Yeah. You talk a little bit before about taking risks. I wonder if you might have some advice for young people or people who want, not necessarily young even, people who want to start their own business and it, particularly uh, if they're Indigenous, what is that, what are, what are some, what's some advice you might give an a entrepreneur who wants to start at least or start getting into an area that they might not even know? I mean, it could be as diverse as Fashion V, uh, you know, mining project shutdowns. I mean, what do you, what, what would be some key advice you'd give them? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I guess that for me it's always about have a crack. Yeah. Go for it, you know. Be prepared. Sit down and think about, you know, where you're going to get the money from, how much you need, what you're going to do, and what it's going to look like, which is going to be your best guess anyway, because it never. That's works right. Never out. turns out like that. <laughs> what you think you're going to do and what you actually do yeah. very often are, are poles apart. Uh, but think about it. And the other thing I always say is, um, you know, don't take no for an answer. And one of my favourite sayings is "Oh Yoda" with his. You know, do or do not. There is no try. You yeah, know, yeah, like yeah. just do it. Yeah. Do you find um, a, a barrier? I, I when I talk to some people who are unsure about how to how to start their, themselves, they always think they need to solve some big problem. They need to, you know, but often it's just get involved and start. They don't need to. They don't need to invent something that hasn't been invented before. Mm-hmm. It's actually just having a crack at doing. And like you just said, I suppose. Do you, Do you think there's a a good market now or a good embracing of Aboriginal culture, and it doesn't necessarily need to be in fashion, but for Aboriginal people, is it they've got a place in boardrooms now? They've got a place in the community. At one hundred percent, absolutely. I think, I think a lot of us lack confidence. Yeah. And some, you know, that's background, right? That's yeah. what we've been told for the last two hundred years. Um, and I, you know, but as I said, the younger generation seem to have it, seem to be. And maybe it's one of those things that you have up until you you start to realise <laughs> what really what really the how little you know about yeah. anything, um, but no, it's it's uh, it's amazing, and I and I, yeah, I just think I, I I'm sort of lost. I've forgotten what the question was. I'm well, sorry. You, no, that's okay. The, the role, like whether or not how embracing society is now of, of Aboriginal, Aboriginal people who want to get involved in business. I mean, they, do you think there is that? you know, societal change or, or, or an embrace and a real positive involvement now, I suppose, that people want to see from Aboriginal people in business. I mean, that's the only way it's going to happen, isn't it, is if we help each other. Sadly, sadly you're right. We do, there is no generational business or very, very few. Yeah. I'm not aware of any 
around here. It's possibly a few in the eastern states. Um, but I think, you know, like we're now considered to be one of the largest Aboriginal businesses in the country. Yeah. If not the largest, you know, like, um, which tells you something. Uh, one of the good things for us here in WA and one of the fortunate, most fortunate things for us is the mining industry actually has genuinely been making efforts to change their approach. It's hard for them to engage with really small businesses and that's why, you know, like we we have part, a role to play yeah, yeah. in that. You know, we'll sort of foster people through and foster businesses through. They'll start to build their own connections and build their own businesses through working with us as a first tier um, contractor to the mining industry. But yeah, it, the world has changed. Um, there's some really weird things going on in the last couple of years, I have to say, and certainly here in, the, in our own country in the last year. Um, but having said that, I think the trend positively and the younger generation, g generally speaking, are interested to see a lot of change about, you know, like about climate, about social responsibility, about, mm. you know, like all of that stuff, how we behave as individuals, as businesses, all of that is changing and it's been at the demand of society mm. and not just shareholders really but it is being obvious it's being seen amongst shareholder groups so it's sort of it's nice to see that um some of it's a little bit weird but you know like i'm older right <laughs> so i sort of when you say some of it's a bit weird what do you mean oh uh, i i guess that you know like um i guess the acceptance of certain behaviors you right, know like right. that I actually had the very good fortune a couple of years ago to spend three months in Paris doing um, uh, learning how to be a fashion designer, actually. <laughs> I won a Church Hill Fellowship and it was fantastic. Uh, but, but I won that and one of my lecturers was Russian and I got to meet a whole group of Russian and Ukrainian people. And this, the stories that you hear from them and their approach to life and how they see things and how they see their leader is completely different and the stories they tell so you know like when mm. you see it from both try and see it from both sides it's like this <laughs> is just weird it doesn't make any sense and it's a it probably politics is probably the best way to describe mm. what i find weird and continue to find weird and the disinformation that we see i think the i mean and the best thing then to do is to make, be able to look at pe look after people in our own backyard right like to look after Absolutely. ourselves and look yeah. after the mob do you, do you think um government i'm conscious that of our time will be wrapping up very soon but uh, government policy has changed quite a bit now with procurement policies and the like that you know want to see a certain dedicated expenditure on indigenous owned businesses that's led to a raft of new indigenous owned businesses but also the issues around black cladding and you know basically uh, non-ownership of but, but ownership in in name only rather than shareholder val sharehold shareholding and um, actual operational management or management of the companies H have you found that it to be i mean i think it's been a very good thing to see that government policy shift i think it's helped foster new businesses come through i think it's helped give new opportunity but with that has come a significant challenge where all these new businesses start so many also fall over have you seen that? I imagine you'd see quite a lot of that, uh, particularly in the, con in the in the mining and resource side. Yeah, it's it is interesting. I like you know we haven't really gone down the IPP path mostly because we've just had enough to keep us busy and yeah. you know our growth um, trajectory has been massive and we're just managing to manage that really. It's yeah, a bit yeah. like that. Uh, so and and so I've looked at the IPP from a you know, from a distance. Um, and I, yeah, I think it's fantastic that the government made a stand on it. And I, you know, more of it, I think yeah. they potentially haven't gone far enough yet. Um, and maybe that's here in, you know, like under my, like what from what I've observed here in WA, it may be different, you know, in the rest of the country. Um, I, we see, we see a bit of that um, people turning up and saying, I've got this, you know, I'm now a, you know, let's say I'm now a, a clothing supplier, industrial clothing supplier. Oh, good. How many employees you got? What do you got? Oh, no, uh, I'm just linked up with yeah, that business, yeah. you know. So you do see that. 
is it a good thing or a bad thing? You know what? I sort of I'm a bit on the fence about it. Yeah, right. It's a thing. Um, all of it is experience and exposure. It's creating networks. It all it's creating understanding of business and how business works. I actually, you know, like I've got non-indigenous business partners, mm. and not necessarily not that I necessarily was choosing that, but they were the ones that had the experience and interest to get it moving. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, so for me, every bit of connection that people are making, would I do I say we need to stamp out black cladding? I'm not sure. You know, like I think, as I was just saying, I think every bit of connection, every network yeah, right. you build, it's, it's actually building experience in our capability in our people, even though it... Um, that's my view on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, I, and I'd just love to see people having a go. One of the issues that was raised at the um, Aboriginal Economic Development Forum that we went to in Darwin, Darwin yeah. um, late, late last year was the level of ownership now, not being 50-50, but actually being 50% Indigenous, 50% non-Indigenous, but actually move into 51-49 in favour of the Indigenous owner where there is a, a, a partnership arrangement like that. And the, the Northern Territory Government is moving in that direction and the federal government's now moving and has commissioned a review that will look at the level of ownership and what an Aboriginal business can be called then uh, if it's not 51-49. Have you considered what that might... I mean, you're obviously a 51% shareholder in, in your own right. Do you think that's a presents... I mean, I think that's going to pre present quite a lot of challenges for the businesses in terms of those who have set up in a 50-50 arrangement. Yeah. And moving away from that will be a very, a quite an interesting departure because it's government's now telling... or government's getting involved in defining A, Aboriginality, B, the level of Aboriginal-led ownership, uh, the percentage that it needs to happen in order for them to be called an Aboriginal business is, but, and yet could possibly invalidate others who are otherwise just in a 50% relationship with their business partner or others. I think that's a, quite a challenge. What do you think, uh, having run these businesses in different structures, that that might look like if, if the government does go down that path? Yeah, it's, it is interesting. Um, and I hadn't heard about that, but, you know, like, um, I know that Darwin is sort of, uh, is always an area where a lot of this stuff emerges. Um, and that's great. It's got to come from somewhere, right? So yeah. Sort of say this stuff. <laughs> yeah. It is good. It, you know, like, I'm, regulations and um, restrictions always, you know, like, I, I'm, um, I don't know, I, I, I have a, a strong sense of, justice and fairness <clears throat> but regulations and restrictions on any people drive me insane mm. a bit so you know like so I'm a bit unusual in that way though I always think that that sort of quiet in you know like that's the black fella in me too it's like <laughs> yeah. you know I, I don't I don't want to be told so that's you right. go telling yeah. me what to do I, my, my personal view on it is you have to look at every business on an individual case you can't say because you know someone's 50 50 that they're not really, you yeah. know, that Aboriginal person isn't operating in that business and isn't doing that. You know, like in my own circumstance, I have to, you know, I don't operate in the day-to-day -day anymore. Mm. Haven't done for the last ten years, well, five years, in, seven years in this business in mm. Warrigal because I've been there, I've done that. You know, like I spent years arguing with clients <laughs> about whether somebody worked two hours or four hours yeah, yeah, and yeah. what they pay for that or whether they'll add an extra 20 cents an hour. Like, I don't want to do that anymore. I, I get a real, real buzz out of making connections, making networks, helping other Aboriginal people, doing things that create a different view of our culture. So if arguing with a client doesn't achieve that, then, you know, I'm not there, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, and I, you know, like just... And I see that a lot <clears throat> in the mob. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. I must be talking too much. No, no. Um, you see that a lot in the mob. Some people are, you know, some people sit in that space, you know, yeah, are already yeah. sitting in that space because that's where their mind is. Others, not so much. But, uh, yeah, I would have to say it's, you, you really have to look at every business on its merits and what they're doing and where they're coming from and what they're bringing to the table and how the bottom line looks. Yeah. You know, and if that Aboriginal person is happy, that Indigenous person is happy with the arrangement and getting fairly compensated and is able to look after his family. Not a bad thing. Not a bad thing. No, no. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. No, like, I, I, don't, I think that's what there's, there's no... 
that's what the government's still trying to figure out, really. Yeah. I mean, it's the this is the issue when you know the, the definitions come in and the regulations come in, and, and they're favourable, um, but then obviously they they'll change in time. Mm. To if they're if, if like the um, forum in the Northern Territory raised those concerns, I think it's right that people look at it. Yeah. You spoke a bit about a, a moment ago about you're not necessarily involved in the day-to-day management or the hour-by-hour management. What does a normal day look for you look like for you now? So, I I sort of <laughs> I run between meetings for around Kirikan, yeah, um, and around Warrigal, and it may be so. Um, obviously, this morning I'm I'm here talking <laughs> to you and again promoting and talking about Aboriginal businesses. Yesterday morning we're preparing for agri futures. Yep. So I spent the morning in a meeting with them. I'm talking on a panel with um, Uncle Oral Maguire. Yep. Um, who else is on it? A fellow from uh, Rain Sticks in the Eastern States um, and Terry Janke, who's okay. a very famous Aboriginal lawyer. You yeah. may know Terry. So we're talking on a panel about about ancient knowledge <clears throat> and, and culture and how does that translate into business and how does that, you know, like what's the future of agriculture in the country because Oral has some very strong yeah. views on, on on cultural management of country and what's happened. Um, so that's really interesting. We, we're, so th- I spent the morning talking to them about that. Then the second meeting I had yesterday was with the WA government, with Jetsy, yep. uh, on the opening up of a trade desk in, in Austin, Texas in March. So we're going over there. That's great. Um, and then I went to Warrigal and had the afternoon with my business partners. And then, you know, like, I, I guess then I went home and walked my dog, <laughs> <laughs> who who's, you, really should be my highest priority, to be <laughs> honest, because he's my best friend, apart from my partner, who some days isn't my best friend. <laughs> so, you know, you know how that goes. Um, so so yesterday was, you know, like, and since I've been, this, this is my first week back at work, yep. since I had a little break at Christmas Last week, I finally did the AICD course on uh, as a director. Though yeah. I'm on a number of boards, um, I operate. You know, like I, I really enjoy operating at that level. Yeah. And again, it, each of the boards that I'm on are either concerned with the development of Aboriginal business or the inclusion of Indigenous people in that business. So, for example, I'm on the board of St John Ambulance, yep. which is going through a huge change and becoming trying to become more relevant um and their interest in making things better Mm. for aboriginal people helping them understand you know the first aid environment and how you know first reaction because lots of the communities don't have those skills internally um so we're talking about how you know how do we get people educated about what do you do if Pops yeah, having yeah. a heart attack, and what do you do? You know, so there's there's all that work going on, which is a massive shift from where it was. That's great. Ten years ago. Um, very quickly, uh, friends of mine have done MBAs, or for, and who have done um, company directors courses. If you had to choose one of those, which one do you think has been most beneficial? Ooh, for very different reasons. Um, I would say, for my personal well-being and my personal. Mm. you know, thinking, I would say the MBA. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, I love the AICD course, but for me it was just a consolidation yeah, of what right. I've done that for makes years. Sense. So the networking in that is remarkable. Yeah. Um, the people that we were on the course with, you know, like just their thinking is sort of out of the box. Um, so that was nice. Yeah. There was another Aboriginal lady on the course with me, one of the Lockyers from up north yeah. so uh, so that was really nice to have that connection with her because I'd heard about Gloria for a long time and she's just as amazing as everyone <laughs> says so um, but yeah for me for me personally I would do an MBA every day of the week yeah right um, just just because it expands your thinking mm. it's a different level I don't you know like I don't always think that education in that sense is about practicality and mm. its practical applications of it. For me, it was about thinking. Yeah. Changed my thinking. So That's that great. Oh, thanks very much for joining us. I might just throw it to our team to see if there's anything we missed. Um, Australia. 
Yeah. I don't have to give a direct answer on that necessarily, but I'd like um, a question around kind of Australia Day and some of the recent discussions and sensitivities around it and where you think Australia is heading. Okay. So one of the things we spoke about before was obviously um, the sort of situations, the, the adjustment that Australia went through, I suppose, uh, in preparing for and then post voice. Um, that was obviously quite a national discussion, but we continue to have national discussions around things like January 26 and, and what that means. Do, do you have a particular perspective on, on what, what January 6 looks like or whether Australia Day should be, ce should be celebrated on that day or anything like that? Look, I... Personally, don't celebrate it um, because of family history, and I'm mm. sure you feel the same way, Zach, about that. We, in our businesses, say to people, "Celebrate, don't celebrate. We're not gonna, we're not gonna celebrate as a business. Mm -hmm. But you make your own choices. We're not gonna stop you doing anything that you choose to do." Um, do we do speak quite loudly about it usually in Kirikan from the Kirikan point of view um, and that's probably where it belongs from mm. my perspective in my business scopes um, but yeah no I won't I, I'm actually heading down south um, for a few days and uh, and and reflecting I guess we always spend the time reflecting mm. on where we are and what we're doing and I think, you know, broadly speaking, Australia's heading in the right direction. I don't love politics uh, and I don't love where politics is going. Um, maybe you're better placed <laughs> to, to comment uh, on me uh, than me uh, on that. Um, and I don't like that it's become... Everything is, you know, like around Australia Day has become politicised. Mm. And even the yes vote, I was shattered that it that it didn't get over the line, but mostly because it was, you know, it sent a message about where we, where we still are as a country. Mm. Um, in terms of the political management of that, I thought it was pretty ordinary. Um, and, and, and somewhat um, ill-considered at the time and, yeah. Do you think that Australia moves to a direction where we don't we will do change the date. And I how, hope so. And how far off do you think that is? I think it's inevitable and I think if it hasn't happened within the next five years, there is something seriously wrong mm. in our political institutions because mm. it is about then about politics, isn't it? Because I think the broader community is yeah, I mean, on the more supportive of the change. I, I've certainly it? noticed a sense of change in um, my non-Indigenous mates who are from... The liberal side of politics, as in the centre right side of politics, and who've their narrative has changed, their conversation has changed now around what it means for Australia Day, um, uh, to the point where they are now just like they just want to see change, and now they would be change, they want to change the date. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily certain it's because they reckon everyone recognises the impact that it has on the indigenous community, mm. um, but certainly they recognise the division that it causes amongst the, the Australian public, public yeah. and that, 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 and they don't want that. Yeah. Um, the politics of division, I think, is is a con is a considerable um, focus now, particularly yeah. post voice. And I, I think it, the attitude definitely. I agree with you. The attitude definitely seems to be moving. Um, it's going to be a matter of one of the parties has got to take a leap on it. I think. Yeah, somebody's uh, got to be brave. I mean, you know, like you you just have to look on some of the social media around whether you know, like the talk of how you know how old is Australia Day? Mm. Well, really, it's only it's just 30 years old it's not really you know there was there's been all sorts of dates celebrated so yeah. why the commitment to it I mean and then there's that sort of extreme group who you know are saying you know if Woolworths aren't selling plastic no. flags made in you know wherever we're yeah. certainly not made in Australia <laughs> yeah um then you know boycott them yeah. seriously you know that I think I think you know that the, there's something wrong when the conversation infects your grocery shopping, <laughs> yes. right? Like there's something something's deeply wrong. And somebody gives a damn about a five dollar, <laughs> you know, plastic flag that's going to end up in landfill yeah, yeah, that's within, right. you know, if it lasts a day, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's just a waste, a complete waste of money, and it's just a huge marketing exercise mm. for retail, really, like which most of our celebrations are anyway. Yeah. Let's be honest. Yeah. 
Um, but look, I would be very happy to see it changed. And, and again, for the reasons that you've just said, mm. it's about the division in Australia. And I mean, it's great to celebrate who we are as a country. Let's let's do that. Yeah. But does it necessarily have to be celebrated on the day that our people started to be massacred mm. and you know, it was genocide started to occur yeah. really in yeah. the country? So. Do you think business has a role in, in uniting the people more broadly, particularly around addressing some of the issues and, and, inequity, and inequity? We certainly have a, feel like we've got a responsibility in educating people. Do we tell them how to think? No, I don't want to do that. Yeah. I want to educate them, though. I want, them let, I want to let people make up their own minds. Yeah, of course. And sometimes, you know, Australians, as Australians... During the last, I suppose, 50 years, we've got really lazy about our thinking. We just do what, you know, we read in the paper or not the NIT because, you know, like they've always got the right story. Absolutely to tell, right. right. That's yeah. right. But, um, you know, like we just, we just believe what we hear on the news and we, we form opinions based on what somebody on the TV, on a, as my dad used to call it, the idiot box, um, says. And it's just lazy. Inform yourself, mm. be educated, understand what's going on, have some empathy and we're all human. We all want the same things. We all want a better life for our kids. We all want them to be safe and comfortable and have a good life and, you know, why, why cause other issues through political means? Oh, I couldn't think of a better way to end the podcast than that. So, Amanda, thank you so much for joining us here on the first episode of uh, NIT's podcast. Thank you so much, Zach. It was a, a pleasure. Good chat. Good yarn. Thank you. Thanks, mate.